If you have First Chronicles chapter 11, please stand for the reading of God's holy word. Go down to verse number 10, 1 Chronicles 11, go to verse 10, and let's read that together. These also are the chief of the mighty men whom David had, who strengthened themselves with him in his kingdom and with all Israel to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Would you bow your heads, please? Brother Hooper, would you take us to the Lord in prayer? What you've already done here tonight, God, is the same thing, God. We thank you, God, for being the blessed of your people. Pray, God, to be the blessed of your people. Stand and pray for the Lord, Lord, you, God, that will happen. Lord, we just thank you for what you're going to do in this place. We give you praise for all time. In Jesus Christ, Lord, in the name of your prayer. Church, say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated if you'd like. <laughs> Many of you know this already, and if you don't, I'm going to tell you now. Um, individually, we can do nothing. But through Christ, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. I want to read something to you, and I just want you to listen to this. I'll give you the location. It's in 1 Corinthians 12. But I'm reading verse, uh, start with verse number 20. And I just want you to listen to this. But now are they many members, talking about us as a church, okay? Yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God has tempered the body together. Can you say together? Say it one more time. Yeah. He, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Verse number 26 says, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. David was just made king over Israel. There is no way that this man of God, that was a man after God's own heart, could do all the things that he did for God. Could, uh, could follow God as he did, could lead a nation as he did without the help of the people that were with him. Without the help of God in his life, he can do nothing. And he can do even more, not only with the help of God in his life, but with men and women that were behind him all the way. Now, I want to tell you a story. And a lot of people try to do things their own, but listen, what one cannot do, two can do together. Amen? And what two can't do, three can do together. And we are made one body in Christ. And if anybody in this church thinks... That they are alone, you are not alone. If anybody in this church feels like you have to go this road alone, you don't. The body of Christ is with you. And a lot of times we don't feel like the body of Christ because we don't act like the body of Christ. And we don't really uh, fellowship with the body of Christ. Well, let me tell you something. That can stop and that can stop tonight. We can have more fellowship and you can have all the fellowship you want. But you have to seek it. Amen? All right. There was a teacher at Vacation Bible School, and she had a new student. It was a little boy with only one hand. And she had made, she had taken great pains, and she was being very, very careful not to let this boy be made fun of. Uh, she included him in all the little crafts and everything like that. It was the last day of Vacation Bible School, and she had been very careful not to let anybody pick on this little boy. She had uh, paired him up with a couple of the kids and doing some activities, and nobody was making fun of him. He was having a great time. And she was so happy with that. At the end, she was just enjoying herself just like normal. And at the very end of the night, she said, Okay, kids, let's do what we always did, and let's put our hands together and make a church. 
And about the time she said that, she realized, oh no. The very thing I've been trying to avoid, I've now done, and I've put this boy on the spot. She hung her head for just a second. She looked up. She was going to say something. And about that time, little girl sit beside him. She said, here, use my right, or my left hand, and we'll use your right hand. We'll make a church together. That really spoke to that, uh, to that vacation Bible school teacher. And it should speak to us in a lot of ways. That what Brother Stephen may not be able to accomplish on his own, him and Brother Hooper could do together. Amen? What, what Sister Alice may not be able to do alone, Sister Alice and Sister Mindy, they could do together. And what those two may not be able to do together, well, Gretchen can pull in and we can all get things accomplished together. There's a lot of people in our community. There's a lot of people in our families. There's a lot of people that are outside these church walls that need somebody. They need some help. Yes, one person can reach a few. But two people can reach so many more. And listen, Satan is against us doing that. But God uses biblical math. He says, one can put a thousand of life, but two can put ten thousand of life. That's why Satan is so afraid. That's why Satan is so afraid of God's people getting together. That's why Satan is so afraid of you coming to church and hearing what God can do. Satan is afraid when God's people pull together. That's why he's always wanting to tear the body of Christ apart. That's why he's always wanting to tear the body of Christ down. He's always wanting separation. He wants separation in families and he wants separation in church. You know why? Because he knows that by ourselves we're easily broken. You take a matchstick made out of wood and you can break it easily. Between, two, between three fingers you can just break it right off. You take two, it's a little bit harder, you can do it. Three, you can still do it a little bit harder each time. But you take a whole pile of them together, you try to break them, you're not going to break them. The Bible says a cord that is wound together of more than one rope is not easily broken. That's why the Bible says that God surrounds us and he binds us with cords of love that what cannot be broken. You see, those cords are made out of love and God is love. So those are made with God's own arms around his bride and we are the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. Listen, God wanted to give David, listen, every king after David was compared to David. Did he walk in his father's, in his father David's shoes? That's, that's pretty much what he was doing. And every time a king was compared to David, they were either as godly as David or they were evil. One or the other. But David did not do that all himself. David had to have mighty men and mighty women with him the whole time to make it what it should be. Our church, the bride of Christ, needs to pull together and accomplish things for God that have not been accomplished before because Jesus is coming back soon. Amen? Listen, there's a story, and it's a true story, of a man that filed a worker's compensation claim. True story. In 1986... To the workers, co worker compensation department, Mr. Joe Blattner filed this complaint. Well, after they looked at the complaint, they said, well, there's something wrong here. We need some verification of this. So on September 12th, he sent them this letter. Gentlemen, I am writing in response to your request for more information concerning Block 11 on the insurance form, which asks for the cause of injury. When I had written, trying to do the job alone. They had asked the client, hey, what's it, what happened? He said, I'm trying to do the job alone. They said, well, that's not good enough. All these injuries, what's going on? So he decides to explain it to them. You indicated a need for further information, so I trust the following will be sufficient. I am a bricklayer by trade. And on the date of the injury, I was working alone, laying brick around the top of a four-story building, when I realized that I had about 500 pounds of bricks left over. It's four stories up, I had about 500 pounds of bricks left over. Rather than carry all the bricks down, I decided to put them into a barrel and lower them by a pulley, which was fastened to the top of the building. So he loaded all the bricks up and put them in the barrel. He went down and secured the rope, tied the rope off, so it would just fly out. And went up to the top of the building and loaded the bricks into the barrel. I then pushed the barrel off the top of the building. Loaded with the bricks. I then went down all four stories and untied the rope. 
holding it securely to ensure a slow descent of the barrel. As you will note in block six of the workers' compensation form, I weigh 145 pounds. Due to my shock of being jerked off the ground so swiftly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Between the second and the third floor, I met the barrel coming down as he was going up. This accounts for the bruises and lacerations on my upper body. Regaining my presence of mind, again, I held tightly onto the rope and proceeded rapidly up the side of the building, scraping my side as I went up. I did not stop until my right hand was jammed into the pulley, and this accounts for my broken thumb. Despite the pain, I retained my presence of mind and held tightly to the rope. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground, and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Void of the weight that was once in it, the, bar the barrel now weighed about 40 pounds. Again, I refer you to block six and my weight. As you may guess, I began a rapid descent. In the vicinity of the second floor, I met the barrel coming up. This explains the injuries to my legs and lower body. Slowed only slightly, I continued my descent, landing on the pile of bricks now. Fortunately, my back was only sprained, and the internal injuries were minimal. My ankles will heal well, I'm sure. And the break in my right foot has been x-rayed and shows only a hairline fracture. That's not all. I am sorry to report, however, that at this point I lost my presence of mind and let go of the rope. As you may imagine, the empty barrel came down upon me with a vengeance. <laughs> And this is the explanation for the 235 stitches in my scalp and my back. The concussion was mild, and my memory should be fine in a few days. I trust this answers your concern. And now you know what I meant by trying to do things alone. I wonder sometimes if God doesn't get a little bit of a laugh out of us trying to do things alone. Amen? I've told you my many mechanical mistakes, <laughs> working on vehicles without any help or any good help, trying to do things alone, <sighs> and unfortunately, I have made more mistakes than I care to recount today. Now, I want to tell you about people that have helped David. I want to tell you about some mighty men that the Bible names, one in particular, his name is Beniah. Go with me to verse number 11. And this is the number of mighty men whom David had. Joshabim, the Hakmonite, the chief of the captains. He lifted up his spear against 300 slain by him at one time. Wow. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo. And you thought you got picked on in high school. He was the son of Dodo. <laughs> the Ahohite, the Aho who was one of the three mighties. He was with David at Pastamim, and there was the Philistines gathered together to battle. And there was a parcel of ground full of barley, and the people fled from before the Philistines. And they set themselves in the midst of the parcel, and delivered it, and slew the Philistines, and the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. We read about that same account in Samuel. It not only had barley in it, but it had what they call chickpeas in it, pretty much. These two guys had a small little parcel of ground that the Philistines wanted. You know what they did? They stood right in the middle of it, David and this guy, and they delivered it from a whole host of Philistines. What should that tell us spiritually? That whatever God gives you, don't give up. Even if it's a small portion, stand on that small portion and defend it with your life. Because your life is not your own. For the God that lives in you will defend it for you. Amen. When God gives you something, he means it to be for you. Not for Satan to take away. You see, David could trust these men because they would defend what God gave them with their life. And so the kingdom was being expanded. And the Philistines were being defeated. But it wasn't just the Philistines. I want you to listen very carefully. Verse number 15. Now three of the captains went down to the rock to David into a cave in Adullam. And the host of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephidim. And David was in the hold and the Philistines garrison was at Bethlehem. And David longed and said, oh, that one would give me a drink of water of the well of Bethlehem that is at the gate. And the three 
broke through the host of the Philistines. When they broke through, they were fighting through it. And drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was at the gate. And took it and brought it to David. But David would not drink of it. But poured it out to the Lord. Now if you were one of the guys that went and risked your life to get that water. I don't know how you feel about that. Here you go king. Thank you. But they understood David had a mind for God. Amen. And he said listen. You guys risk your life. That made this water very valuable. And I would be remiss if I took this water upon myself. Something this valuable belongs to God. And he gave it to God. Isn't that awesome? I've told you this story before, but when I was six or seven years old, my dad gave me an orange before church. And I grabbed that orange and I peeled that orange all the way down. It still had some of the white strings off me. I took it. And I peeled every little, I loved oranges. Peeled every little string off of it. It was the perfect orange, Brady. It looked beautiful. Plump, round, juicy. No strings attached. (laughs) I was just getting ready to eat that orange. And I remember dad talking about his sermon and it was about this. It was about David pouring that water out because it was so precious. I looked at the orange. I started thinking about that glass of water. I was like, man, this is precious to me. I really want to eat this. And I stood there on the porch of the house looking at the orange and thinking about that. And I said, oh, Lord, I've got to give this to God. And I want to eat this. But I've got to give it to God now because, it's, because I've taken all this time and made it so precious. I've got to give it to God. I don't know if he accepted my offering because I slung it. I went, ah! And I watched it as it tumbled through the yard, never to be eaten by man. I don't know if he received it, but I had to write hard, I think, a little bit. Okay? So y'all pray for me. (laughs) Go up to verse number 20. And Abishai, the brother of Joab, he was chief of the three, for lifting up his spear against 300, he slew them and had a name among the three. Of the three, he was more honorable than the two, for he was their captain. Howbeit, he attained not to the first three. uh, Beniah. Now, this is what I want to tell you about. Where is Zach? Zach? All right. Get ready, buddy. Here we go. You ready? Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of of Kabzeel, who had done many acts. The first thing he did was he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Now listen. As a church body, the world is going to come against us. And when the world comes against us, we are attracted to the world because of the flesh. Isn't it true? It, it is, it is a, a, a lustful thing. We want The world has so many things to make this body feel good. Isn't it true? That advertisement and what's on TV and what's on radio, what's in magazines, what's on the air show, all of these things make you want these things. By the way, amen. But the things that are bad for us the, the flesh craves these things. Am I right? Anybody, anybody battle with that? Okay, good. I'm in the right place. So let Moab represent the lust of the flesh. Because the Moabites started in a cave. Lot and his two daughters had just fled from Sodom and Gomorrah. God had destroyed these cities by fire and they were holed up in a cave. Thought God was going to strike them down. Well, the daughters growing up in Sodom Felt like, well, we're not going to have any children. And they did a horrible thing. They had kids, not get too graphic, but they had kids by their daddy. And their kids, the one daughter's descendants, were of Moab. So we have the Moabites here. And the Moabites were coming against David and his men. And as they came against David and his men, what they would do is just like Goliath went out to the Philistines, the Moabites sent these two lion-like men out. They either, I I don't think it was the way they looked. I think it was the way they fought. That's why they call them lion. Very agile, very nimble, very fierce. And they sent their two giants out there. Now, I don't know what what the giants are in your life. I don't know what Satan has sent to knock on your door every day. 
to, to, to tempt you every single day. I don't know what that is. But let me tell you something. It's, it's, like, it's not just like one person's coming at you or not with just one thing. But they always come in pairs, seems like, or triplets. Amen? And they came against him. They came against Benedict. And guess what happened? He slew them both. How did he do this? How did he overcome two against one? How did he overcome all of these things, all of these temptations that the world put there? He did it by the power of God, and he knew he had a king and an entire army at his back. Let me tell you something. The way to overcome the flesh is know that you have a friend in God. Know that God will defend you, and his spirit lives in you. And he's not going to leave you alone, but he will fight for you. He will fight for you. If you don't know it, face it and put God on the job. God will fight for you every single time. And if you want victory in your life in those areas, let God have it. Let his spirit fill you. Let him lead you and guide you. Because let me tell you something. This man did not pick up a staff. He did not pick up a spear. He didn't pick up a bow and arrow unless God told him to do it. Because he was being led by God. You see, the Bible starts out talking about David's. I think he named, uh, on down in the verses, he named like 55 valiant men. But at the end, he only has 37 when David dies. I wonder why that is. Because some were led by God. Or maybe they were at first and fell away from God. God help us to stay one of the valiant men or women that God has. Amen? What did he do next? Let's find out, Zach. Go over to the next part of that verse. Also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Why was the Holy Spirit so particular about it? Even where he, he fought the line. You just tell me a man fought a line. That's impressive. And if I had to fight a line. If I had to pick the knee. We're going to have some wooded area. A drawbridge. A wall. Hmm? Definitely not a pit with no exit. This man's in a pit. You never get put in a pit with a line. Unless you've done something. Can I get an Amen. And understand this, maybe the Philistines capture him and put him in this pit. I don't know. But the Spirit goes on to tell us that it was on a snowy day. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like the cold. Some people really hate the cold. Amen. Some people hate the cold so bad that they would put up with just about anything not to be cold. <laughs> Let me tell you something. This guy was cold. He had no maneuverability. There was no exit. Here and alive. The Bible says our adversary is as a lion that roams to and fro seeking whom he may devour. Satan is on the prowl for you. Me and Brother Pez back here, we were talking this morning about straddling the fence. See, Satan, he's sly. And a lion is sly. You ever see a lion on the prowl? Their mane and their fur is the color of the savannah. So when they get down, you can't see them. And they don't jump up and walk. They crawl and they sneak. And their eyes are locked on their target. Let me tell you something. You've got a target on your back being a Christian. And Satan's eyes are locked onto you and he's watching you. He's watching for any sign of weakness. And when he sees a sign of weakness, listen, he doesn't want to pull you totally over to his side. No, no, no. He's more satisfied when you're on the fence. How many of us know that when somebody's on the fence, they believe in God, but they don't really attend church like they should. They're not all wrong, but they're not doing all right. These are the hardest people to get back in the church. These are the hardest people to talk to about God. These are the hardest people to convince the importance of being in God's house. How many know that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because Satan's got them halfway convinced that they're okay. The other half knows they ain't. Amen? How did he defeat this? He had the power of God in his life. Same way as before. The Holy Spirit was upon him. The power of God was in his life. And he had an entire army at his back and a king that supported him. You know, it wasn't the king, though, and it wasn't the entire army at his back 
that really made the difference when he was in the pit with the lion. Because let me tell you something. Kings and churches and families and people and friends will let you down. And when all these let you down, you feel like you're alone in a pit with a lion. But God is right there. Hallelujah. God is right there every time. When you've got more month than you got paycheck, God is right there every time. When, when the doctor's pers- uh, when the when the doctor comes back and he and he's got the report, hey, let me tell you something. God is right there. For Brother Mike Henderson tonight, God is right there. Let me tell you something. I have no doubt that, that man feels alone and he feels like he's in a pit right now. But it is the family of God. It is the bride of Christ that can lift him up. And though he may not be face to face with him, let me tell you something. God's spirit goes through walls and he goes across mountains and through distances and into his heart and his life. And God will put his arms around him and he will comfort him. Oh, that's the Holy Spirit's work. Give God some praise. Hallelujah. And it's our job to bind with him in prayer. It's our job to fight Satan. The biggest battles that you fight Satan aren't keeping your mouth shut and going off on somebody. The biggest battles are fought on your knees. Are fought laying in bed at night. When you're praying to an almighty God about a situation that's too big for you. When you're praying about the lion that you're in the pit with. The good thing is God doesn't leave us alone. Now, Zachy, here we go. Here's your part. And he slew an Egyptian, a man of great statue, stature, five cubits high, between seven and nine foot tall. This was the Egyptian's man. You see, it was through God and the binding of the of, of, of the togetherness that David's kingdom flourished. Through his men. They defeated the Moabites. They defeated even the natural world. Satan. And fear. But now. Here comes the world. The world with its. Egypt with its. Libraries and. Its gold and its chariots. And its big cities. The world with its fascinations, with its way of doing things, it says, hey, you're okay no matter what you do. You're just fine. Don't let anybody talk down to you. Don't you dare think that you're wrong in anything. It's just the path we're taking. Every path leads to God. You see, this is the world. And the world is symbolized right here in this Egyptian. When they fought back then and you were a champion, you had gold bracelets. You had a gold vest on. And this guy was seven to nine feet tall. The Bible says that his spear was as a weaver's beam. In other words, like a flagpole. That's how big this thing was. As he walked up to Ben, he looked at him and he said, This guy's only got a staff. He's got a piece of stick. I've got a spear that can reach out and touch someone. Amen. I got a spirit that's got a pointy end on it. And all this guy has is a staff. Hmm. You see, what he didn't see is more important than what is seen. When people look at us, we go into society. What they see is there's Brother Hooper. Well, there's Tim. There's Robin. There's Steve. There's these people. Ah, they, they're not the richest people in the world. They, they, they might have a little bit of money, but you know what? No. They, they're not too wealthy. They don't have a whole lot of power. I mean, they're, they're, just, they're not really great and connected and stuff like that. They didn't make a name for themselves in sports. People start talking about the things you don't have. You ever notice that? Because they judge us on our outward appearance. They judge us by what they see. But what is unseen is greater than what is seen. If they could see with spiritual eyes just for a moment and see the encampment of angels round about. You know, I'm reminded of a story in the Bible where a prophet came outside and he was surrounded by the enemy's army. And the, and the prophet's servant came out and he said, oh God, we're going to die. And the prophet prayed and he said, God, take the blinders off his eyes. Let him see what I see. And 
And when God took the blinders off and he could see the spiritual world, he saw the chariots and the horses and the angels that were surrounding the enemy's army. You see, that's the way it is when Satan comes against you. That's the way it is when Satan fights against you. What is seen is the battle, but what is unseen is greater than what is seen. Because God has surrounded the enemy. You see, this is what I'm talking about. This is why David became great. Because here's what happened. God enabled Benah to grab that staff. And as that Egyptian came toward him with that spear and started to stab him, he took that staff and he got it right up under his hand. And he, went, and he flipped the staff right out of his hand. Then he looked at that his spear, threw his staff down, and grabbed the spear, and he killed him with his own spear. Not because he was a big man. Not because he had been trained in war. But because he had God on his side. Because the Holy Spirit worked in him. Now, let me tell you something. We may not fight literal lions today. But it sure seems like we're in a pit sometimes with one, doesn't it? We may not come against two lion like men and have to really get on with our hands over our mouths. Boy, it sure seems like sometimes when family's hurting, doesn't it? We have battles. And you can try to face it alone. Or you can face it with God. And if you want to be measured with the great men and women of the Bible, let me tell you something. Believe God. Because God does not love them more than he loves you. He loves us the same. And he will fight for you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. <laughs> This is what God gave me for tonight, and that's what I have given you.